There is one thing stronger than all the armies in the world. Famous French author Victor Hugo wrote in his book, The Future of Man. And that is an idea whose time has come. Well, the gospel of Jesus Christ is much more than just an idea. The gospel, as Romans 1.16 says, is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. That word power in the Greek is dunamis. We get our English word dynamite from it. The gospel is the dynamite of God for breaking down sin's barriers and setting the captives free. And in the first century A.D., its time had certainly come. As Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a virgin under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Stephen was martyred for sharing that very truth. Persecution followed, and as a result of that persecution, the church was on the move. The salt shaker was literally, I mean the salt was literally being shaken out of the Jerusalem salt shaker to be spread all over Judea and Samaria just as the Lord had commanded in Acts 1-8 when He said you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now the events in Acts 8 center around four different men. First, we see a zealous persecutor of the church, Saul of Tarsus. This is in verses 1 through 3. The book of Acts and the letters of Paul give us enough information that we can piece together uh, Saul's early life. He was born in Tarsus in Cilicia, a Hebrew of the Hebrews according to 2 Corinthians 11.22, and the son of a Pharisee according to Acts 23.6. We learn in Acts 16, 37 and Acts 22, 25 through 28 that Saul was a Roman citizen by birth. Most of the Jews, if they were Roman citizens, they had to buy it. It means that Saul's family at one time or another had done such a service to the empire that they had been awarded citizenship. We know that Saul got the finest education a Jewish man could get in that day when his Family sent him to Jerusalem to be educated at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the greatest rabbis of that day, recognized even into the day, today by the Jews. That would be like sending your child to Harvard or to Yale to, or one of the other Ivy League schools. It wasn't cheap. You paid a lot to the rabbi to educate your child. Plus, you had to, he had to have room and board, a place to stay, all of those things. So we know that Paul must have come from a family that certainly wasn't poor. We've met Gamaliel already in Acts 5. We remember his speech to the Sanhedrin probably saved the apostles' lives when he said, you know, if this is not of God, it's just going to die. So just leave them alone. And they beat the apostles instead of killing them and let them go. Saul became a devoted Pharisee like his teacher Gamaliel, according to Acts 26, verses 4 and 5. And Paul tells us in Philippians 3, 5 that measured by the law, his life was blameless. Saul was one of the most promising Pharisees in Jerusalem, well on his way, according to Galatians 1, 14, to becoming a great leader of the Jewish faith. Paul proved his zeal for the law by his ruthless persecution of the church. He really thought that that persecuting the believers was a service to God. So he did it with a clear conscience, he tells us in 2 Timothy 1.3. He obeyed the light he had, and when God gave him more light on the road to Damascus, that blinding light that was actually the risen Christ, Saul became a Christian. As we'll see next week as we look at Acts 9. How did Saul persecute the church? Well, he sought to completely destroy the church. We see here in Acts 8 and in Acts 22, 4, the verb used is is the word that's used to describe a wild animal that's tearing its prey apart. We're told that he persecuted both men and women unto death, Acts 22 says, entering both houses and synagogues, having believers imprisoned and beaten if they renounce their faith in Christ. Compelling them to blaspheme, Paul says in Acts 26, 11, they were set free. If they did not recount, they could be, recant, they could be killed. In later years, Paul described, him, described himself as exceedingly mad against them, and that's Acts 26, 11, where he also calls himself a blasphemer as he denounced Jesus Christ. 
He was, according to his own words in 1 Timothy 1.13, a violent persecutor. He was very effective in that persecution because although he was just a young man, he had great authority given, in, given to him by the Jewish religious leaders. Paul's devotion to Moses and the traditions of the elders uh, completely controlled his life. And it almost completely destroyed his life. He did it all, Paul says in 1 Timothy, ignorantly in unbelief. But fortunately, God had mercy on Saul. God saved Saul. And by His great grace, God used Saul in some amazing ways. But Saul was absolutely the last person in Jerusalem that you would have chosen or suspected would ever become a Christian and certainly, it was just beyond imagination that he would become the great apostle to the Gentiles and write the majority of the New Testament as he wrote his letters of instruction and encouragement to the early Gentile churches. We'll see more about Saul next week in Acts 9. The second man we meet in Acts 8 is a faithful deacon and preacher named Philip. This is in verses 4 through 8. Persecution does to the church what wind does to seed. It scatters it and it only produces a greater harvest. The word translated scattered in Acts 8, 1 is actually the word that's used for a farmer sowing his seed. The believers in Jerusalem were God's seed. And persecution was used by God to take them to new places and plant them in new soil so they could bear much fruit as they shared the good news about Jesus Christ. Everywhere they went, they shared why they had to flee Jerusalem and leave their friends, leave their businesses, leave their homes behind and why it was worth it because of all that they'd experienced in Jesus Christ. Among those who were scattered by the persecution, we're told that followed the stoning of Stephen was Philip, who like Stephen, was one of the seven appointed to serve tables in Acts 6.5. When the persecution came after Stephen was stoned, we're told that Philip went to the city of Samaria where he proclaimed Christ to the people. There were miracles of exorcism, miracles of healing as part of Philip's ministry. And as a result of all of these amazing signs and Philip preaching the good news, many Samaritans believed in Jesus. Luke records in Acts 8.8, 8, there was much rejoicing and great joy in the city. No one would have ever thought that a Jew would do anything to help the Samaritans, much less bring great joy and rejoicing. But Jesus had already indicated He cared about the Samaritans, and now Philip comes to finish the job that Jesus began when He visited with the woman at the well at, in Samaria on His way to Jerusalem. There was a long history of prejudice and conflict between the Jews and the Samaritans. To the Jews, the Samaritans were half-breeds, half-Jews, half-Gentiles, descendant of, descendants of pagan colonists who moved into Israel following the Assyrian conquest of the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 B.C. But the Samaritans maintained that they were completely Jewish, the descendants of Israelites who had either not been deported or had returned from Assyria, but it wasn't true. They were intermarried with non-Jews and so they were looked down on by the Jews in Israel who had maintained their national and religious purity by only marrying other Jews. The Samaritans had their own version of the first five books of the Old Testament, the books of Moses, the Pentateuch. and That was the only part of the Old Testament that they accepted as Scripture. Because the Jews wouldn't allow these half-breeds to worship in the temple in Jerusalem, the Samaritans built their own temple on top of Mount Gerizim, a rival to the temple in Jerusalem. The Samaritan temple was destroyed in 129 B.C. by John Hyrcanus, a Jewish ruler, but the Samaritans continued to worship on Mount Gerizim. Many of you will remember that Jesus was confronted by this rivalry over where one should worship when He talked with the woman at the well. You know, and you remember in John 4.20 that he tells her a time is coming and now is when those who worship the Father in spirit and truth won't worship him on this mountain or at the temple in Jerusalem. But they'll worship him in spirit and in truth. So when Philip comes in Acts 8 preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, we don't see this conflict, you know, between 
where you should worship. The preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ broke down the dividing walls between the Jews and the Samaritans. When the news of the Samaritan revival reached the apostles in Jerusalem, Peter and John were dispatched to Samaria according to Acts 8.14. The Holy Spirit hadn't come into the lives of the Samaritan believers before Peter and John arrived. Not because they hadn't really accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, but because as the gospel moves beyond just Jewish believers and now into these who are half Jews and half Gentiles, God's going to use Peter and John, the two disciples closest to Jesus, to validate that the Samaritans are now full brothers and sisters in Christ. That they're no longer inferior in any way. There there are no stepchildren in the kingdom of God. Now it was necessary for Peter and John to come from Jerusalem and put their hands on the converts and impart to them the gift of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because God wanted to unite the Samaritan believers with the original Jewish Christian the Jewish Christian church in Jerusalem. God didn't want two different national churches that would perpetuate the division and the conflict that had existed for centuries. In Matthew 16, 13 through 20, Jesus had given Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? We argue about what that means. Well, I'll tell you what I think it means. I think it means that Peter had the privilege of opening the door of faith to key groups of people as the gospel spread. In Acts 2, we see him at Pentecost, you know, fully opening the door to the Jews. As the Holy Spirit falls, Peter officially opened the door to the Samaritans in Acts 8. And later in Acts 10, he'll open the door of faith to the Gentiles as he goes to preach to Cornelius' family before Paul begins to minister to the Gentiles. Now, it's important to remember that the first ten chapters of Acts record a period of transition. The gospel of Jesus Christ is spread to the Jews first, and then to the Samaritans, and then to the Gentiles. And in each case, the Holy Spirit is given as a sign of God's approval. But God's pattern for today, for the way the Holy Spirit is given, is found in Acts 10, the story of Cornelius and his family coming to Christ. A sinner hears the gospel, they believe, they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and then they're baptized. That's the pattern that you see in Acts 10 and from that point on all throughout the Bible and in early church history. Many of the eras and heresies about the Holy Spirit that exist today are because people develop their doctrine and practice from this transitional period that is recorded in Acts 1 through 10. The experiences seen there are special one-of-a-kind, one-time events like the giving of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. No one believes today that when the Holy Spirit comes into a person's life that you have to hear a mighty rushing wind and tongues of flames have to appear and then you have to uh, be able to speak known languages that can be understood by people from other countries. This is a a one-time experience, you know, as the, the Holy Spirit is given for the first time to the Jews. It's a mistake to base any doctrine or practice only on what's recorded in Acts 1 through 10 because these chapters of the Bible record a unique time in salvation history that was transitional. Those who claim we must be baptized first and that baptism then results in us receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit have a hard time explaining what happened to the Samaritans. And those who claim we must have the laying on of hands to receive the Spirit have a difficult time with what happens in Acts 10 when the Holy Spirit comes on Cornelius and his family, you know, without anyone laying hands on them. But once you accept Acts 1 through 10 as a transitional period in God's plan, with Acts 10 being the climax that establishes the norm that we see throughout the rest of the New Testament and in the early church, then the problems are solved. Now the third man we meet in Acts 8 is a clever deceiver named Simon the Sorcerer. And you see him in verses 9 through 25. Simon is one of the most interesting people to appear on the pages of the Bible. You know, it's a basic principle of Scripture seen over and over again throughout the history of the church that wherever God sows His true believers, Satan is eventually going to sow his counterfeits. You remember Jesus said the wheat and the tares will grow up together. Well, you know, Satan's tool in this case was a sorcerer named Simon. The people of Samaria had been amazed for years by the counterfeit magic and so-called miracles that Simon did. Therefore, they believed the things he said. They considered him the great power of God. 
Now, Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12, that the type of sorcery that Simon practiced is energized by Satan and was used by Simon to magnify himself. Philip's miracles were very different. They were empowered by God. They pointed to Jesus Christ. They glorified Jesus Christ, and they helped other people. Simon started to lose his following as the Samaritans saw Philip's true miracles of God that focused on helping others, not magnifying Philip. The Samaritans then listened to Philip's message. They believed in Jesus Christ. They were born again, and they were baptized. Now, what does it mean in Acts 8.13 when it says Simon himself believed? Well, the answer to that question is best found by asking another. What was the basis of Simon's belief? What was the basis of Simon's faith? His faith wasn't in the Word of God or in Jesus Christ, but in the miracles that he saw Philip perform. There's no indication that Simon ever repented of the sin of using the dark magical arts, you know, of Satan. Uh, We're told in verse 21, Simon's heart was not right before God. His faith wasn't a saving faith, but it was like the false faith of the people of Jerusalem. According to John 2, verses 23 through 25, witnessed Jesus' miracles and believed in the miracles, but not in Jesus. And Jesus said he wouldn't trust himself to them because he knew the way people were. Simon followed Philip not to hear the word and learn more about Jesus, but to witness the miracles and perhaps learn how they were done. Now the true wickedness in Simon's heart was fully revealed by Peter and John when they arrived from Jerusalem. Simon not only wanted to perform the miracles that Philip performed, he also wanted the power to convey the gift of the Holy Spirit to others, and he was quite willing to pay for the power. It's from this passage that the English word simony, which means the buying and selling of church offices or privileges, comes. As you study the book of Acts, you're often going to see the gospel in conflict with wealthy and powerful people whose lives are driven by their love of money and power and popularity. Ananias and Sapphira were evidently a prosperous business couple who lost their lives in Acts 5 because they lied about the sale price of some property so they could keep some of the money for themselves, but to have the same glory and public adoration Barnabas had received when he sold to Phil and gave all the proceeds to the church. In Acts 16, verse 16 through 24, it tells us Paul put a fortune teller out of business in Philippi and ended up in jail because he destroyed the fortune telling business of the men who owned this slave who could tell fortunes because she was demon possessed. And when Paul healed her, she no longer could tell fortunes. I cast the demons out of her. In Acts 19, Paul's preaching the gospel in Ephesus, and it caused the silversmiths to lose money on their sale of the silver idols of Diana or Artemis that they sold, and they caused a riot aiming to destroy Paul and the early church in the city. You see, the early church had its priorities straight. It was more important to preach the word of God than to win the support of wealthy and influential people of the world. Now, Peter's words to Simon give every indication that this sorcerer was not a converted man. He says to him first, Thy money perish with thee. In other words, you're perishing. May your money just perish with you. That's not the language you use with a believer. Peter went on to say to Simon that he had neither part or lot in this matter, in this word, the imparting of the Holy Spirit. And Peter tells Simon that his heart was not right before God. Peter also calls him to repent. Now, Christian believers, we're supposed to repent of our sins. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But the actual command to repent in the Bible is usually given to unbelievers. Peter goes on to tell Simon in verse 22 to pray so that perhaps God will forgive him for having this thought, this thought of buying the gift of bestowing the Holy Spirit. Now the word translated thought here in Acts 22 means a plot or a scheme, and it's used to describe something that is wrong or evil. The fact that Peter tells Simon he's full of bitterness and a captive to sin is the seal you know, on the fact that Simon had never truly been born again. Simon's response to Peter, severe words of warning, is not very encouraging. Simon's more concerned with avoiding judgment than getting right with God. There's no evidence that he ever repented or sought forgiveness. 
He, he asked Peter, well, pray for me that, you know, I might not come into this judgment. Well, a sinner who wants the prayers of others but won't pray for forgiveness for themselves is someone who's not going to enter the kingdom of God because I can't do your repenting for your sins for you. You have to do it yourself. Now, this episode shows how close a person can come to salvation and still not be converted. Simon heard the gospel. He saw the miracles. He gave a profession of faith and he was baptized. And yet, he was never born again. It reminds me of Jesus when he's talking in Matthew 7, 21 to 23 about the final judgment and there are people who stand before him and said, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do mighty, many mighty works in your name? And Jesus says, I never knew you. Simon was one of Satan's clever counterfeits and Peter, had he not exposed the wickedness of Simon's heart, Simon might have been accepted as a prominent member of the Samaritan church. And who knows how much damage he might have done in that group of people who'd been so badly damaged over the years. Like the story of Ananias and Sapphira, God will not allow Satan to insert counterfeits into the leadership of the church in the days of its infancy. But if the early church fathers are right, Satan will still use Simon later to try to mislead believers and destroy the church. Now I think it might be interesting for you to know that although only 12 verses of Scripture are given to Simon's story in the Bible, volumes and volumes were written about him by the early church fathers, the disciples of the disciples of Jesus. If you read the writings of the post-apostolic fathers, you'll find that Simon was betrayed as the heretic of all heretics, a figure often compared to the coming Antichrist. According to these post-apostolic traditions, Simon went to Caesarea after, he after his encounter with Peter in Acts 8. There, Peter confronts him again and held debates with him on various doctrines. The early church fathers say Simon then went to Tyre and to Tripoli and from there to Rome, where he continued to disseminate his false teachings. The early church uh, fathers say he identified himself as the promised paraclete, the Christ, and took the name of he who stands, indicating his divine power. Simon claimed he could turn himself and others into various beasts, and he said that he had the power to make statues speak. The early church fathers claimed that Simon was the one who developed the heresy of Gnosticism that Paul was continually fighting against in the churches he founded. The early church fathers also tell us Simon had a companion, a prostitute of great beauty by the name of Helena, whom he told people was the incarnate wisdom of God, the very thought of God, and the mother of all angelic orders. All of, Satan, uh, all of Simon's life was lived in, an, in ostentatious wealth, luxury, and sexual debauchery. And all, now, now all of this is simply religious tradition. We don't know how much of it is really true and even if it's all true, even if Simon can rightly be accused of all the wickedness the church tradition has attributed to him, and even if Simon was, as Eusebius, the early church historian declared, the author of all heresy, I believe the greatest mistake he made in his life is right here in Acts 8. He attributed to money and miracles more power than they actually have. He thought, this is my passport to a great life and a great future. For just a minute, he was so close to accepting the gospel and being permanently changed. He could have been delivered from Satan's power. Instead, he doesn't repent there in Acts 8. He continues to be Satan's tool. He almost certainly, behind all of that church tradition, there's at least some truth. You know, but Satan's not a kind master. He may allow moments of pleasure now, but he gives an eternity of pain to those who follow him. Here's an interesting juxtaposition in Scripture between Simon Peter versus Simon the sorcerer. Simon Peter lives, not an especially easy life, but he dies a man of integrity and faith, and he has the uncountable trillions and trillions of eternity with God in heaven. Simon the sorcerer deceives many, lives luxuriously uh, for the 60, 70, 80 years that he lives upon this earth, and then he spends an eternity in hell. It's quite a contrast worth reflecting on, and that's what the early church fathers wanted us to do.
Well, back to Acts 8, even though the persecution in Jerusalem is still going on, Peter and John return to Jerusalem after their time in Samaria, preaching the gospel, it says, in many villages of the Samaritans as they went their way. They didn't want to lose the opportunity to share the good news with the Samaritans now that God had opened the door to them. The final man that we're going to meet in Acts 8 today is a concerned seeker, an Ethiopian. And this is found in the 26th through the 40th verse. To me, this is another very interesting passage. Philip was not only a faithful preacher to large groups, he also was willing to spend time with people one-on-one to help them come to know Jesus Christ. Like his master, he was willing to leave the crowds, the 90 and 9, and deal with one confused and troubled lost soul. Philip's experience, I'd encourage all of us when we think about personal witnessing for Jesus Christ. To begin with, God directed Philip to the right person at the right time. Now, we're not likely to have angels instructing us. I've never had any angels instructing me, but we can experience the guidance of the Holy Spirit. If you're walking in the Spirit and praying for God's guidance, He'll lead you to those who are ready to hear about Jesus Christ. And you just share, begin to share with them. And if they're not interested in what you have to say, you just change the subject. The Bible tells us not to cast our pearls before swine. Well, Philip goes to share with this court official. He's his country's treasurer. He didn't come from what we know today as Ethiopia. His home was in ancient Nubia, located south of Egypt. Since he was a eunuch, He could go to Jerusalem, he could worship God, but he could never become a full member of the Jewish faith because of the prohibition in Deuteronomy 23.1 against those who'd been castrated ever entering into the assembly. So you have this influential and wealthy and powerful man in his own country who had a place of respect and influence, but he's not satisfied. He's looking for something more. And he's concerned enough about his spiritual life. He's traveled over 200 miles to Jerusalem to worship God. But what he learned about Judaism in Jerusalem still hadn't satisfied his heart. The Ethiopian, I think, represents many people today who are religiously interested. They may even occasionally read the Bible and seek the truth, but they just don't understand how it all goes together. They can't put the pieces together. They need someone to show them the way. As Philip draws near to the chariot... He hears this man reading from the prophet Isaiah. You see, God had already prepared the man's heart to receive Philip's witness. If you obey the Holy Spirit when He leads you to speak with someone, you can be sure God's gone before you and He's prepared the heart of that person He wants you to share with. Isaiah 53 was the passage the eunuch was reading, the prophecy of God's suffering servant. Isaiah 53 describes Jesus Christ in His birth in verses 1 and 2. His life and ministry in verse 3, His substitutionary atoning death in verses 4 through 9, and His victorious resurrection in verses 10 through 12. It's a startling picture of Jesus Christ. The Ethiopian focuses on verses 7 and 8, which describe our Lord as the willing sacrifice for sinners, even though He Himself has done no wrong and He loses His own rights in the process. Isaiah 53, 7 and 8 says, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was punished. And as Philip explained these verses, the Ethiopian eunuch began to understand the gospel because the Spirit of God was opening his mind to God's truth. Our job is just to share what we know about God. God never expects you to share any more than you have. If all you say is, you know, God is just so good. It just makes me feel so much at peace to go to church or so happy to, you know, to, to read something from the Bible. If that's all you know, that's all God expects you to say. It's God's job to give the people we share with the eyes to see the truth and to be changed. The idea of a substitutionary atonement that the Ethiopian eunuch is reading about in Isaiah 53 is found from the beginning of the Bible all the way to the end. God killed animals so that He could clothe Adam and Eve in Genesis 3.21 after they sinned. God provided a ram to die in the place of Isaac in the wilderness. 
at, in, that's Genesis 22. At the Passover, innocent lambs died for the sins of the people of Israel. And the entire Jewish religious system was based on the making of animal sacrifices, shedding of blood. Yes, there were grain offerings and there were different types of offerings. But Leviticus 17, especially verse 11, makes it clear you know, that the forgiveness of sin was based on the shedding of blood. Jesus Christ is the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. The Bible tells us He was the fulfillment of the Old Testament sacrificial system that was just pointing to the ultimate Lamb of God. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of many of the prophecies of the Old Testament. But people have to be told about Jesus' sacrificial death for their sins. They have to understand, well, why would I be accepted by God? If, they're not, if it's not explained to them, you know, how will they ever know that it happened or what it all means? Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The, the Ethiopian heard the Holy Spirit speaking through Philip's witness. He believed in Jesus Christ. He was born again. His experience was so real and so excited to him. He had his caravan stop when they came to water. He had Philip baptize him immediately. And then Philip is miraculously called away by the Holy Spirit to minister in another location. Just like Elijah in 1 Kings 18. But the Ethiopian treasurer, Acts 8 says, went on his way rejoicing. Even though he was a eunuch, for the first time in his life, the Ethiopian was now fully accepted by God and felt complete and whole. Well, Philip ends up in Azotus, which is about 20 miles from Gaza. And then he makes his way to Caesarea, a journey of about 60 miles. I think I would have said, well, God, if you're going to transform me by the Spirit, it would just be just better for me if you just took me the whole 80 miles, you know, and didn't leave me to walk the last 60. Why was that? Well, you know, evidently, as he was talking with this Ethiopian, they're going farther and farther out just into the desert, you know, and they get to this last oasis, and that's where he's baptized. And then there's nothing. There's no people. There are no villages, you know, for 20 miles back. So the Spirit brings him back to where their village is, but then what we're told is like Peter and John in Acts 8.25 tells us Philip preached his way home. You know, he preached at all these little villages going back along the way and he, until he finally ends up in Caesarea. Who knows, maybe Philip was a prominent businessman, uh, you know, and, and had, a, had a summer home in Caesarea by the sea. We don't know, but he evidently stays in Caesarea uh, from that point on, and Acts 21 tells us that uh, Philip provided housing and meals for Paul and his traveling party as they made their way to Jerusalem on that last trip that would result in Paul being arrested and ultimately taken to Rome. Now as you trace the expansion of the gospel during this transitional period of Acts 8 through 10, you'll see how the Holy Spirit is reaching out to the whole world. You start with the story of Adam and Eve and then the fall and, you know, their descendants. They knew about the one true God, but they drift away. And then you have Noah and the flood and his family knows about, you know, but, but then they drift away. Well, here you see in Acts for the third time, God is calling the whole world back to himself. As you look at it in Acts 8, the Ethiopian was converted. He was a descendant of Noah's son Ham. In Acts 9, Saul of Tarsus will be saved, a Jew, and therefore descendant of Noah's son Shem. And in Acts 10, the Roman centurion and his household find Christ and their descendants of Noah's son Japheth. The whole world was populated by Shem, Ham, and Japheth, who all knew God. But like the descendants of Adam and Eve, the descendants of Noah's three sons drifted away from God. Well, now in the book of Acts, God is calling all people everywhere back to Him one last time. God wants the whole world to hear the message of the gospel, just as Jesus commanded in the Great Commission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, you know, uh, and baptizing Him in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In, Act, in, in October 1857, J. Hudson Taylor began to minister in Ningpo, China. He led Mr. Nye to Christ. The man was overjoyed and wanted to share his faith with others. How long have you had the good tidings in England? Mr. Nye asked Hudson Taylor one day. Taylor responded that England had known the gospel for many, many centuries. My father died seeking the truth, Mr. Nye said. Why didn't you come sooner? Taylor had no answer to that question. 
Maybe if those who'd had the gospel for so many centuries had worked harder and come sooner sharing the gospel, maybe China would be a very different place than it is today. We don't know. But the real question for us is, how long have you known the gospel? How hard have you worked to share it? You know, doing that isn't my idea. It's not the church's idea or a strategy for church growth. Doing it's the command of Jesus Christ as God calls the whole world back to Himself. You know, Isaiah had another prophecy. The 53rd prophecy talks about the first coming of Christ, His birth, His ministry, in amazing detail. Isaiah is an amazing book of prophecy. But he ends his book in the 66th chapter with another prophecy of Christ's second coming. In verse 15 of that 66th chapter, See the Lord is coming with fire and His chariots are like a whirlwind. He will bring down His anger with fury and His rebuke with flames of fire. For with fire and with His sword the Lord will execute judgment upon all men and all men will come and bow down before Me, says the Lord. You know, in the Old Testament, the Jews at the time of the Exodus... Uh, they were saved by the blood on the doorposts of their their homes. Wouldn't it be terrible if you were a Jew who'd heard the instructions of Moses and you didn't tell your neighbor, you know, if you put blood on the doorpost to signal that you have faith in God, the angel of death will pass over you. How terrible it is when we know that Christ is coming again, this time not to save, but this time in judgment as He brings all things to an end. And we know about the blood of Jesus Christ that covers our sin and saves us, and yet we don't share it. The message of the book of Acts over and over again is about how God is calling us as individuals and us as the church to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, as we look at the prophecies of the Old Testament, we are amazed how specifically you talk about Christ's birth and His life and His death and His resurrection. It's startling, Father, in Daniel and Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel and so many of the books of the Bible, so many prophecies that are so detailed. And yet, Father, those prophets also speak of another time when the Messiah comes in triumph, Father, and will be King of kings and Lord of lords, when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But on that day, the Bible says, it will be too late to change, Father, too late then at that point to come to Him. I pray, Father, that You would help us to take with renewed seriousness the wonderful gift of the gospel that we've been entrusted with. Not to just hoard to ourselves, but we live in a world that so desperately needs to hear of the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fact that God is on our side and is not against us, that He forgives us. And all of it, Father, not because of anything that we do or can do, but because of His great grace, His great love extended through us and His death on the cross. Father, I pray that you would help us to listen for the voice of your Spirit and to see those opportunities that you open for us to share the love and the message of Jesus Christ with people who are seeking even today. You say in your word, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send out laborers into the harvest field. And I pray, Father, that you would send out laborers into your harvest field from this congregation not to force their faith on other people, but to share with those whom your Spirit is preparing even now that are in the places we live, the places we work, the places we go. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.